What's going on, everybody? What is going on? It is Friday, March 8th, 2024, and we are back here on the Torian Rain Reloaded channel for another Friday weekly live stream. If you have not done so already, be sure to hit that like button. Be sure to also hit that share button. I would greatly appreciate it. Shout out to everybody that's in the chat so far. Shout out to everybody that is a mem uh, subscribed to the Patreon, those who are members of the channel. Shout out to you as well, as well as everybody who follows me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and in the Discord, and everyone who sends me stories on a daily. I greatly appreciate it. So we have quite a few stories that we're going to be talking about today. Honestly, it's not that many stories. So this might be another one of those streams that went by rather quickly like it did last week. So that's always a good thing. But as long as we get the point across, that's even better. But let me go ahead and acknowledge the people who are here so far in the chat. We have Janesta, Haxon KT, Ice Spider, Wallow J, RDRD, Cosma Fury, Lady Messenger, Denise Scales, uh, uh, let's see, Letitia. Till Dog 12, Kid Gravity Beyond, Derry B, Darlene, Reparation Nation, Mission Vision, Vision, PD That Remains, Mariam R, O007, Spidey 2, Albert Nelson, Stay Positive, DSB, DSA 1, Stuns. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Tawana Cook, Don P. Ben Yehuda, AW1, Lakeisha Mitchell, Travis Tippins, and Iron Will. Shout out to everybody that is here so far. I'm glad that everybody is here. I hope everybody had a good day. I hope everybody had a good week. So I'm just trying to set something up right quick for tomorrow. and okay cool so as y'all already know what i like to always make sure to do is if there's any positive story to put out there first i make sure to start off with that first so let me go ahead and share my screen right quick and we can go ahead and get started so congratulations and kudos to wendell pierce for landing the role as Perry White in the upcoming Superman movie. I've been a fan of Wendell Pierce's career since I think I first saw him in anything. And this predates The Wire. Of course, many people know him from being on The Wire because that's where I think that's where his name really, really started to circulate and get out there like that. He's done a couple of movies here and there. And I'm glad that he's still, you know, he's getting his flowers because sometimes... A lot of, you know, black actors, they can get, you know, put under the radar. They can't have too many going on at one time. So when I heard about this, I said, this is huge. I mean, definitely kudos to him for James Gunn to say, you know what? I want to work with this guy and have him be Perry White. And he has some big shoes to fill because if y'all remember, the last person that played Perry White was Lawrence Fishburne in Man of Steel. And that was back in 2013. So you're talking about 11 years ago. And I believe Superman, it was called Superman Legacy, but then they took off the legacy and just made it Superman. I actually liked it, liked it under that name, but it is what it is. So that movie is slated to come out in July of next year, I believe. So definitely congratulations to him. And for those of y'all who are unaware with the Perry White character, Perry White is basically the uh, head of the Daily Planet. He's the boss to Clark Kent and Lois Lane. And if they do him like if they have his part be sort of like how they did with Lawrence Fishburne in Man of Steel, he's going to have a quite a bit of screen time. I was actually surprised with the amount of screen time that Lawrence Fishburne had in Man of Steel. But hopefully they, you know, don't under you underutilize him, even though he's not the star of the movie. But he definitely does play a pivotal role to the Lois Lane and Clark Kent characters. So definitely congratulations and shout out to him. Iron Will said, what happened to him playing B.B. King in the biography? Um, I wasn't aware that he was supposed to be playing B.B. King. But now that you mention that, 
he does kind of have the look for him. Honestly, I can see that. I can see that being, you know, good casting. So definitely shout out to him. Very phenomenal, great actor. He kills every role that he does. I don't think this man has done a bad role in any role in any capacity that he's ever done in his life, no matter how big or small the role is. And I see y'all are like on, in the chat right now listing his resume. That just shows that we are aware of this man's roles outside of the wire because so far nobody really has mentioned anything wire related. I think well, except for Kid Gravity, <laughs> he mentioned his character name. But outside of that, everybody knows him for doing other things and other projects. And this one will be a huge one for him. Kid Gravity said he's theater trained. Well, well, there you go. You can always tell when you have them theater trained actors versus those who are not. Because Denzel Washington comes from the theater. That's why he's so good. That's why he is so good. But definitely congratulations to him. And I can't wait to see what he's going to do with this role when Superman comes out next year. So now that we've gotten the good news out of the way, now it's time to get to the bullshit. Because you know we can't stay there too long unfortunately. So the first story we're going to be talking about is Nature Boy. Uh, well, his real name is Allegio. I believe that's how you pronounce his name, Bishop. Um, in case y'all are unaware who Nature Boy is, he was a, or is a, or was a cult leader. And this man's life and just him overall it's just buried in just being completely strange and weird. I mean, I'm sure that whoever had to be in the courtroom to listen to this man's case and all the stuff that he's done were probably sick to their stomach and probably couldn't wait to get up out of that damn courtroom. I'm going to be honest. Had that been me up in that courtroom, I probably, the minute that I was done with the proceedings, I would have ran right on home and took a shower. Because I'm very sure that everything that was heard and said in that room probably made everybody feel funky. So I'm going to read this article that's coming from moguldom.com. It was posted on March 6th. It says, Atlanta, I'm sorry, alleged Atlanta cult leader Nature Boy sentenced to life in, life in penitentiary for violations. Alleged cult leader Allegio Bishop, also known as quote unquote Nature Boy, has been handed a life sentence without the possibility of parole after being found guilty on March 1st of multiple charges, including violations. A jury reached a verdict following a trial that shed light on the disturbing activities within the so called Carbon Nation group led by Bishop. The sentencing, which took place recently, marked the culmination of a legal battle that began when Bishop was arrested in April 2022. A neighbor told WSB TV in 2022 after Bishop's arrest, Carbon Nation is his cult. He's been whooping girls, beating girls, fertilizing girls, and getting girls ready for marriage. A grand jury later indicted him on five charges, including violations in July 2022. The arrest came after allegations surfaced regarding his leadership of the group and the perpetration of heinous crimes against its members. Subsequently, a grand jury indicted him on five charges, including violations in July of that same year. Bishop, age 40, was found guilty on all counts with the most serious charge of violation resulting in a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Additionally, he was sentenced to, to 10 years for false imprisonment with other related charges carrying concurrent sentences ranging from 12 months to five years. The case shed light on the practices with the Carbon Nation Group with testimonies from former members providing insight into the alleged abuse and manipulation they endured under Bishop's leadership. One former member identified a Bishop's girlfriend revealed to authorities that she had been subjected to revenge corn. I'm going to just say it like that, but y'all can see it on the screen. After leaving the group and underscoring the psychological and emotional toll inflicted on victims, Bishop's wife and former cult member told Eleven Alive he had sexually and emotionally abused members. During the trial, witnesses recounted harrowing experiences of abuse and manipulation with one describing Bishop as a monster to us all. The judge said to Bishop, a.k.a. Nature Boy, during sentencing, you're a master manipulator and probably the classic definition of a narcissist. The fact that he's a cult leader is not on trial, Assistant District Attorney Michael Coveney said, Complex reported. It's how he used, exploited, and abused his members. Before his sentencing, some of Bishop's former cult members shared testimony about the abuse they experienced. And that's the whole article right there. 
This reminds me so much of Nexium. If y'all been following me for a while, um, probably <clears throat> if y'all been following me probably since before or around 2022, 2021, around that range, y'all heard me talk about that cult Nexium, which was led by a man named Keith Raniere and the actress from Smallville, Allison Mack, was a part of that cult, and they were doing some wild stuff in that cult too. But I rem remember first saying about this dude years ago. I seen like videos and stuff on there, and the guy was just st a straight up creep. He was a straight up creep. And some of the people are leaving little details in the chat right now for those of y'all who are unaware with who this guy is. But I wouldn't be surprised if they did a full fledged documentary about him, and then you'll be able to get more details about it. But this article right here just scratches the surface because it only tells you what he was charged and found guilty of. But the details of it are extremely disturbing. Melanated Mantra says, if you heard of allegations of a, against the popular content create, I think I know what you're talking about. I think I know what or who, what and who you're talking about. Yeah, I briefly heard that. I don't know how true it is, though, so I can't really speak on it. But um, good thing that he 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 he's someone who got exactly what he disturbed deserved, honestly, truthfully, and hopefully all of the people that was under his, I guess you could say, his brainwashing can get the proper therapy that they deserve. Now, while one person is on their way to jail for the rest of their life without the possibility of parole. Somebody who's been in prison since the early 2000s is about to get out soon. And that person is none other than Demetrius Flannery Sr., a.k.a. Big Meech. Before I go any, into this story, how many people in this chat watch BMF? Now, if y'all are part of the TVC If you are part of the TVC, y'all, I know y'all watch it. All right, so quite a few of you don't watch it, but that's fine. But I'm sure many of y'all heard the name Big Meech before. And shout out to AB Promotion for the 199. I'm, glad, I'm so glad I don't know most of these people. Wouldn't hold it against you. But basically, Big Meech was a big time, I guess you could say, distributor back in the late 80s and early 90s. And probably throughout most of the 90s and early 2000s up until the time he got caught. And he started a organization with his brother called BMF, which stands for Black Mafia Family. And they're basically telling the story of it right now through a television show, ironically, called BMF on Stars. And they're in their third season currently right now. And I believe they just got renewed for a fourth season. I find it is very interesting that he's he's about to get released soon because he's getting released like uh, like about a good five years earlier than he was supposed to. But he's slated to most likely get out possibly next year. So I'm going to read this coming from hiphopdx.com. It says Demetrius Big Meech Flannery might be released from prison way sooner than expected per a new development in his case. On Wednesday, February 28th, the Detroit News reported that the Black Mafia family co-founder could be out of prison by 2025, three years before his latest reduced sentencing of 20 years. He was initially handed a 30-year sentence back in 2008. 
The former crime boss attorney, Brittany K. Barnett, was able to have 32 months trimmed off of his punishment thanks to Amendment 821 of the United States Criminal Code emphasizes rehabilitation after he was found guilty of large-scale dr drug trafficking and money laundering. Thrilled about the update, Flannery's son, Little Meech, who also plays him on the show, took to his Instagram stories and reshared posts about the news soon after it began circulating online. Barnett filed an early release petition on behalf of Flannery last month, claiming that he could be released earlier than initially intended per new sentencing guidelines, especially since he is no longer a threat to society. According to court documents obtained by Hip Hop DX, she filed the motion with the Eastern District of Michigan in early January, demanding a retroactive application of sentencing guidelines. In summary, she argued that since the ex-BMF leader has been nothing short of a model sentencing citizen while serving time, getting his GED, doing well in his other prison classes, and staying out of trouble on the inside since 2021, he's earned credit for his sentence under the USSG or the United States Sentencing Guidelines, Amendment 782, and therefore should be released by 2025. The founder of the Buried Alive Project, Barnett, first received national attention in 2018 when she worked with Kim Kardashian to free Alice Johnson, who was sentenced to life in prison in 1997 for cocaine trafficking, even though it was her first offense. She served 21 years in prison before being freed in June 2018. Barnett initially petitioned for clemency for Johnson during the Obama administration. However, it wasn't until the reality television star took note of the case and brought it to the attention of her then husband, Kanye West, that she was ultimately granted a pardon by the Trump administration. So there you have it right there. This changes the whole landscape of the show now because they was only able to communicate with him, with him being locked up as far as the show goes. But now that he's about to be out, that means, and I told somebody else this, he could most likely end up being on the set of this show while they are filming it so they'll have the actual person right there in front of them instead of talking to them over the phone so season four is going to be very interesting now but we shall see what's going on detroit i knew detroit i knew you was going to pop up in here Oh, look, the, the the neighborhood troll has entered the chat. Roberto Suarez, can somebody please block him? He done crawled out of his cave and decided to crawl into this chat. Appreciate it, Wallow. So that's that story right there. So yes, he will be getting out next year. They don't know when in 2025. They just know that it's happening in 2025. So let's move on to the next story. And that involves Terrence Howard. Why is Terrence Howard in the news? Well, according to the Hollywood Reporter, it says that he is ordered to pay nearly $1 million in federal tax evasion. But it's not just because of tax evasion. I truly believe it's because of what he said. He said the latest legal entanglement for the Oscar nominated actor came after he told a Department of Justice official that it is, quote unquote, immoral to tax the descendants of slaves. How ironic that he gets hit with a $1 million federal tax evasion after he makes that comment. That's no surprise or coincidence right there. You mean to tell me that if he, if you really want to get him with this tax evasion thing, y'all could have got to him before, but the minute he says this, now you want to bring that up. And what did I tell y'all? Whenever they want to go after a lot of black people in Hollywood, how do they do it? Let's just go after them and say that they committed tax evasion. If they can't get them on nothing else, let's just hit them on their taxes. So let's see what they're talking about here. A federal judge in Philadelphia has ordered Terrence Howard to pay a penalty-heavy $1 million in back taxes. 
a skirting of payment that the actor justified in a voicemail to an official where he asserted that it's immoral for the government to tax the descendants of slaves. The Academy nominated actor has been pursued by the Justice Department for over a year for non-payment of a $578,000 income tax bill covering what he owed from his 2010 to 2019 returns. Howard, age 54, has not responded to the DOJ or turned up to hearings. So on February 22nd, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania found in favor of the federal government and a level of 903 thousand one hundred and fourteen dollars and seventy two cents judgment against the actor that figure accounts for unpaid federal income tax assessments penalties and interest for the 2010 2011 2016 2017 and 2019 tax years according to the judgment obtained by the hollywood reporter and accrued interest up to december of 2023 which has and will continue to pile up until howard pays while the Empire star declined to defend himself in court, his justification for the long-time non-payment of his income tax bill was given in a voicemail that the court attached to its ruling. After the Justice Department escalated the situation by filing a lawsuit against Howard in 2022, the actor allegedly responded to a voicemail that the case's top DOJ attorney, Maria Elizabeth Rue, left with a claim that he would post the suit online in an attempt to shame her. 400 years of forced labor and never receiving any compensation for it. Something tells me Terrence Howard has been listening to the new black media, especially when we talk about tangibles and reparations. Now you have the gall to try and prosecute and charge taxes on the descendants of a broken people that you are responsible for causing the breakage. Howard said in the message before it briefly cuts off. He then continued after calling back according to the judgment in truth the entire united states should by default become the property of the descendants of slaves but since you do not have the ability or the courage to do it let's try this in court we're going to bring you down in a career that's included portraying men who have been dogged by legal troubles one empire plot arc has his drug dealer turned music mogul hounded by the doj the case is the latest in a rocky few decades for hollywood that has art imitating life Howard's career, I'm not going to read that part um, right there. Huh, so that's what Terrence Howard pretty much had to say. It's a whole lot more on there, but y'all pretty much get the gist of it. I'm actually shocked. He actually came out and actually said those words out of his mouth. Of course, they're going to look at him kind of funny. And you know, they, you know, the usual suspects going to have something to say about this. As they usually do, because they are the usual suspects. Where they're saying something along the lines of, oh, what is this uppity Negro thing he's talking about? He don't got to pay taxes. If I got to pay taxes, then, then he has to. My family came from this and that and the third and poverty and all this and that. They were indentured servants, uh, ser uh, indentured servants. And we got to pay taxes. Oh, my family was attached to this and that part of oppression. Why do I have to pay taxes? You know, that's what they buy. You know, that's probably what they said. I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised. But damn, they said <laughs> they said this man ain't paid his taxes since 2010. They said his stuff goes back to 2010. You're talking 14 years. But on the flip side, I do see what Terrence Howard is doing. He's basically pushing it like he's forcing their hand. He's basically saying, if I, if you know, if we just don't pay, if we just collectively come together and we don't pay our taxes, we could literally sink them. And we all know that Terrence Howard's taxes are way, 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 way higher than ours would ever be, most likely. But I'll follow this along and see what happens. I'm not sure exactly where this is going to go. I kind I know where I would like for it to go, but then again, it's not up to me. So let's move on to the next story. As a matter of fact, the next two stories both deal with Elon Musk, the next two stories. So this first one right here that's coming from Time, it says Tesla 
to face nearly 6,000 black workers in a factory racism lawsuit. 6,000, y'all. Now, I don't know how many black employees Tesla has, but 6,000 is a lot for just one demographic, just for one group of people. We're not talking about 6,000 employees, no matter what their ethnicity is. We're talking about 6,000 black people who work for Tesla. And I bet you a lot of these lawsuits go back to when Elon Musk was the CEO of Tesla. Now, I bet all of these are not from when he stopped being the CEO. Almost 6,000 black workers from Tesla's incorporated California factory can sue the car maker collectively over claims that it failed to protect them from racism under a tentative ruling by a California judge. So they basically now, from this California judge said, y'all now have free reign to go after Tesla. Alameda County Superior Court Judge Noel Wise said Wednesday the workers should be allowed to proceed with class action status because Tesla's alleged pattern or practice of failing to take reasonable steps to prevent discrimination was a common issue for all the black workers at the Fremont plant. Now, the last time I remember Tesla being sued, it was this black man a few years ago. Y'all might have heard about it. And he has sued them for millions on top of millions of dollars. And I think he won his case, too. And that was just one man. Imagine 6,000 suing all at the same time. The judge gave Tesla until Thursday to contest her ruling and schedule a hearing for Friday for the parties to argue their positions. The lawsuit was filed in 2017 by Tesla worker Marcus Vaughn. I think that might be the guy that I'm talking about who claimed that the factory production floor was a hotbed of racist behavior. According to the complaint, co-workers and supervisors routinely used racial slurs and employee complaints to human resources went largely unanswered. So 2017, Elon Musk was still the CEO of Tesla then. Tesla initially responded to Vaughn's suit with a blog post titled Hotbed of Misinformation, denying wrongdoing and saying the company had fired three people after probing alleged incidents. Tesla representatives didn't immediately respond to a request for comment on Wednesday's ruling. The judge said she would split the trial into two phases if the case does go to trial. During the first, the jury would decide whether Tesla failed to do enough to prevent discrimination and harassment. If the jurors find Tesla liable, then in a second phase, the plaintiffs would pursue their claims for damages. Elon Musk, electric vehicle maker, who has repeatedly been hit with damages and racism suits by individual workers and is also fighting claims by the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and California Civil Rights Agency. The case is Vaughn versus Tesla Incorporated RG 71788-2082, California Superior Court, Alameda County. And if you see how Elon Musk runs X, None of what I just read to you should surprise you. Remember, when he be officially became the owner of X, formerly known as Twitter, they said the N-word usage on that platform went up by 500%. And if you are on X, just look at the people that he replies to and decides to engage with on that platform. A lot of them are anti-Black. So that's the first story I have right there on Elon Musk. But there was also a second story that happened with him. And this time it does deal with the platform he does own, which honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't own it for very much longer um, in the future. And that's this story right here. X's anti-trans policy reversal draws ire and concerns from the academy advocates and Twitter users. And by the way, uh, this was posted on March 5th, 2024. So in case y'all are unaware of what they're talking about, um, they, <laughs> the users on X got so upset because Elon Musk 
I guess you can say bent the knee to the advertisers and basically said, look, we are going to go back on the whole, you know, freedom of speech thing when it comes to talking about people in the academy and, and allowing y'all to have free reign to really say what y'all wanted to say about them. And they got so livid. And y'all already know who they is. And they were so upset. But so, let's see what they're talking about on this site. In a contentious move that has drawn sharp criticism from advocacy groups and users alike, X, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter, has significantly altered its policy on anti-trans hate speech. Exactly while OJ Money speaks. And you know what walk. You know, money talks, bullshit walks. Essentially reversing itself on a prohibition it recently implemented. The shift comes amid backlash from white right wing users and influencers, notably including Shia Rachik or Rachik of Libs of TikTok, and has raised more questions about the platform's commitment to protecting Academy users from harassment. The original policy, designed to reduce the visibility of posts that misgender or dead name users if reported by the targeted individual, was quickly revised to clarify its narrow scope. Rychik had complained to Musk about the policy change, a complaint Musk responded to promising that Rychik wouldn't be suspended for misgendering transgender people. After several right-wing influencers piled on, X changed the wording of its policy. On Friday, far-right extremist influencer Tim Fool, y'all know him as Tim Pool, announced on X that he would stop advertising on the platform. I will be terminating all ad spend commitments and verified accounts over X reinstating the misgendering policy, Poole wrote. Musk wrote, I mean, Musk responded to Poole on Saturday, assuring the anti-academy influencer that bigotry is still permitted on X. Turns out this was due to a court judgment in Brazil which is being appealed but should not apply outside of Brazil, the billionaire wrote. And that's just Tim Pool's uh, response right here. The rule now stipulates action will only be taken in jurisdictions where local laws are ex explicitly mandated, effectively narrowing the scope of the policy and leaving most users unprotected. Bell Turek, senior fellow for tech advocacy and academy inclusion in the human rights campaign condemned the revision emphasizing the lack of u.s laws requiring social media platforms to limit targeted misgendering and dead naming x's commitment to act only when the law requires that it do so is an insidious sleight of hand she accused x of implicitly capitulating to hateful and extremist ideology thus jeopardizing the safety of academy users and empowering those spreading hate and misinformation so there you have it right there honestly this as far as i'm concerned that is a them problem let them deal with that see you said i quit facebook and tweety a long time ago CRU Reality says, I'm not calling anyone some delusional fantasy. But you know what's so interesting, though? I don't know if it's still there. On X, when I typed in the word Sambo, I would get an email to my from Twitter saying that they limited the scope or the reach of that particular post. Like, they would basically hide it. At first, I thought they hit or tried to hide the entire account, but it was just that particular post. And in any variation that I typed it, they did the, they did the same thing. But you let on your platform the inward fly like it is. But see, this is a double-edged sword. On one hand, I can see why people would be upset by this. On the flip side, these are the same people that couldn't wait to use the N-word against us the minute he signed on the dotted line that he owned X. I mean, when you think about the people that's upset, they mentioned Tim Pool. That should tell you all right, you need to know right there. As a matter of fact, Tim Pool was one of the first people I saw who got upset behind that Google AI thing last week. I meant to mention his name when I talked about it last week. But yeah, when you see who's most upset about it, 
then it all makes sense. And shout out to the 200 people that's in here right now. Shout out to y'all. Make sure y'all hit that like button if you haven't done so already. So now we shift from Elon Musk. We Actually, we are shifting outside of the establishment and we're heading to Ghana. Because speaking of Academy, if y'all are unaware of what Ghana just did, well, you're about to find out. But the question is, how long will it last? Because like Rollo J said earlier, money talks, bullshit walks. Ghana Anti-Academy Plus Bill, President Akufo Addo or Addo or do to wait for Supreme Court ruling. So in case y'all are unaware of what's going on in the country of Ghana in Africa, they basically put down a bill to make it basically to basically ban anything related to the academy. But it's only been a bill and it's been sent to the Supreme Court for ruling, but they haven't responded yet with it. And they're in, they're probably in a bind right now because on one hand, you know why they want to do it. But on the flip side, like Wallow J said, that money that they could generate. That's what they're also worried about. That's why I keep telling people when it comes to that bottom line, they're always going to go with that. But let's see what they're talking about. Earlier, the finance ministry warned that billions of dollars in World Bank funding could be lost if it became law. What did I just say? And the first line in the statement is about money. Passed by MPs last week, it imposes a jail term of up to three years for identifying as a member of the academy and five years for promoting their activities. The Supreme Court challenger says there was no quorum when the bill was passed. Uh, same sex activities, I should say, is already against the law in Ghana and carries a three year prison sentence. The proposed tough new legislation, the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill was backed by both the Ghana, both of Ghana Maine's political party. But lawyer Richard Della Sky who has filed the application with the Supreme Court says there weren't not enough MPs in the chamber when the vote took place. According to parliamentary rules, at least half of Ghana's 275 MPs must be in parliament and take part in the vote for a bill to be passed on to the sign to president into law. It has not been reported in the Ghanaian media how many MPs took part in the vote last Wednesday. The bill has been widely condemned by the UK and the US and rights groups have described it as regressive i'm not surprised that the uk and the us were uh against it i'm not surprised at all the president had previously said the, that he would sign it if the majority of Ghanaians wanted him to do so but he is now seeking to assure the diplomatic community that ghana is committed to upholding human rights he acknowledged that the bill had raised considerable anxieties in certain quarters of the diplomatic community and amongst some friends of Ghana that the country may be turning her back on her here, here the two inviolable longstanding record of human rights observance and attachment to the rule of law. I want to assure you that no such backsliding will be contemplated or occasion. He added on Monday, the country's finance ministry said Ghana could lose a total of 3.8 billion dollars in the world bank funding over the next five to six years ghana is suffering a major economic crisis and last year had a bailout from the international monetary fund it is unlikely that the supreme court will rule on the case before presidential and parliamentary elections due in december some of the cases filed earlier by human rights groups to stop the bill were not heard before the vote took place. The elections will see the Ghanaians vote for a new president. Mr. Okufo Addo or Adu will be stepping down at the end of his two terms. Like I told you, if there's money involved, then that's when they have their I'm in a bind Nate moment. For those of y'all who understand the reference from Set It Off. That's right, Wallow J. Billions with a B. $3.8 billion. That's, Ameri that's, an, that's an American currency, but translated to euros is 3 billion euros. So they're saying you can choose to make this a law if you want to, but just understand this. 
if you do make it a law, you will lose around $3.8 billion. So I guess we'll have to wait and find out what decision they end up making at the end of the day. Let's move on to the next story. Now, this story right here is so wild to me. And when I first heard about it, I instantly thought of Ray Carruth. So let me go ahead and play this news. Thank you. A former St. Louis middle school principal pleaded guilty to federal murder for hire charges in the death of a teacher and her unborn child. In March of 2016, elementary school teacher Jocelyn Peters, seven months pregnant, was found dead in her Central West End apartment. The federal grand jury indicted Cornelius Green, her boyfriend and ex-principal, in that murder for hire plot. Newly released court documents reveal Green pled guilty as part of a plea agreement dismissing local murder charges. The deal also calls for Green to be sentenced to life in prison. Investigators say Green orchestrated the murder, enlisting the help of a childhood friend, Philip Cutler. Cutler's trial is set to begin later this month. All right, so there you have it right there. It's a very short clip. So you had this guy right here on the right. He got his friend right here on, I mean, on the left. I'm sorry. You got this guy right here on the left who got his friend right here on the right Murder to go Chucky out and, a- and delete this woman who was a teacher at the school he was a principal at because he got her pregnant. And she probably was going to go to terms with the, with the baby. He might have been in a relationship with another woman and he didn't want her to have the child. He probably told her to not have the child and she decided to oppose it. And he ended up having her deleted. That's why I said it reminds me of Ray Carruth. Only difference is this child didn't survive. That's like, you know, what's so crazy. Some, like I said, sometimes you just never know what goes on in the minds of people because people can present themselves one way. And then you look at them and it's like, damn, who would have thought that you could have been in this type of person? APD remains. He said the two lose, they deserve recompense for that. Well, the one who did the plot, he he they said he got life in prison. Well, he's looking at life in prison, I should say, because they this is just a plea. He's probably doing this, of course, so he can get a plea deal to see if he can get a marriage reduction. Oh, so Wanda right there, our, re- our resident uh, newswoman it says he was married with children. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. I said, I bet you he was either in a relationship with another person or he was married and had a whole family. And he stepped out on his marriage and had an affair with this woman and she got pregnant and he didn't want her to have the baby. And she was probably like, nope, I'm going to have this child. And then when that didn't work, he hired his friend to take her out. So really, when you think about it, it's a it's a double deletion because one, you took out the mother and she was pregnant. So you took out the child, too. Nine times out of 10, that's most likely what it was. And then they worked together, too. So that's most likely where they met. You know, the principal should know all of their teachers and he knew her. And well, here you go. Yeah, I heard about that. I heard about that, Cosmo. That's some that's some that's some nasty work right there. I'll say that. Yeah, shout out to Tawana. She if y'all in the Discord, Tawana be posting up news articles all day, every day. And when I say all day, I mean even all the way into the wee hours in the morning when we be sleep, she'll still be up two, three, four, five in the morning posting articles. That's why I never run out of things to talk about is mainly because of her. And whenever I can't, whatever I can't talk about in the premiere video, I'll throw it into these live streams or sometimes the midday streams. And it's like I said, it's mainly because of her. She kind of reminds me of uh, Lisa, Lisa Cabrera, when I was first starting out, like doing my uh, YouTube channels, because Lisa used to always send me a bunch of emails with different stories. And I just told her flat out, Lisa, you need to create your own channel. Mission Vision said he should have just accepted that divorce and the new child and he would still have his freedom. And that fool of a friend should have said no. Right. There was so many avenues that this that guy could have did or what he could have did was. And it's the easy part. 
not step out on your marriage. That would have been the easy thing for him to do. But that temptation took over. But now he has to live with the consequences of his actions and his friend does too. Let's move on to the next person. And that is Chad Wheeler. Huh, Chad Wheeler. In case y'all are unaware, Chad Wheeler was sentenced to uh, 81 months in prison for the attack, the very brutal and almost life-ending attack on his ex-girlfriend a couple years ago. So he got sentenced to 81 months, which really equals out to about seven years. Former Seahawks player Chad Wheeler was sentenced to nearly seven years in prison Friday for the 2021 assault of his then-girlfriend. Wheeler, a backup defensive tackle for the Seahawks in 2019 and 2020, was arrested the following year in Kent on suspicion of assaulting his girlfriend at the time after his trial was delayed repeatedly due to his defense team's request for mental health evaluations. He was found guilty in November of first and second degree assault. The jury found he used force or means likely to result in death. He was found not guilty of unlawful imprisonment. King County prosecutors recommended Wheeler be sentenced to nine years in prison. Wheeler's defense attorneys, however, requested a sentence no longer than the mandatory five-year minimum, arguing in the filing that Wheeler, quote-unquote, needs mental health treatment. Of course he does. Of course he does. Not additional prison time. Of course they said that. Superior Court Judge Joe Compag Compagna on Friday ordered Wheeler to undergo a mental health evaluation and following, follow any treatment recommendations. Once Wheeler has completed his six... Uh, his almost seven year prison term with credit for any time he's already served prior to trial. He will spend three years on the Department of Corrections community supervision, though the jury found Willer guilty of both first and second degree assault. The second degree assault charge was what's known as a lesser included alternative filed in the event. Jurors didn't find him guilty of a more serious crime. The judge vacated the second degree assault charge and sentenced Wheeler only for the first degree assault. Wheeler, who posted a $400,000 bail and was on an electric home detention with GPS monitoring prior to sentencing, was booked Friday into the Malang Regional Justice Center pending his transfer to DOC custody. Wheeler's former girlfriend testified during his trial that he demanded she, quote unquote, bowed down to him on the day of the January 2021 assault, and he began strangling her after she refused. She told a 911 dispatcher that night that she was being killed, exclaimed, and she was yelling out several times and begged for help and for the police to break down the door to enter her home. Wheeler pushed her into the bathroom and locked the door when police arrived, and it took several officers to detain him. The court documents said the woman lost consciousness twice, two separate strangulations. She regained, she regained consciousness to find a pool of blood on the bed and alleged Wheeler calmly commented, oh, you're still alive. The documents also said Wheeler pinned the woman down with his body. Mind you, Wheeler is six feet, six feet, seven inches and weighs over 300 pounds. The woman was treated at UW Valley Medical Center in Renton and, health, and several healthcare workers testified about her injuries. The defense claimed Wheeler's diminished capacity at the time caused him to unintentionally and unknowingly harm her. A defense attorney said during closing arguments that Wheeler and his lawyers weren't contesting that he strangled his former girlfriend and broke her arm and argued his mental state prevented him from intentionally committing a crime. After Wheeler was found guilty in November, his defense alleged juror misconduct and motion for a new trial. The court denied the motion, saying the allegation was incredible. The Seahawks waived Wheeler shortly after his arrest, and he has not been on the NFL roster since. What's going on, Tamika? PD Mermaid says she's about to get money in a civil suit. Oh, they about to pay her splendidly. Especially now that he's been found guilty of pretty much uh, whatever they could find him guilty for. So she's a shoe in to win that civil suit. So it all said, where the hell was Sage Steele, Malika Andrews, and Stephen Asmith to speak out on this or Jason Blimplock? Nowhere to be found. And that can be spread across all the people that you just mentioned. Janessa said, where's her family at? 
Um, good question. Well, that closes the chapter on this story. But I have one more story to go over. And this initial this literally was a last minute throw in, but I said I had to talk about it. And it's coming from this website called Black Brazil Today. So as y'all know, a couple of weeks ago, the movie One Love came out, which is the biopic about Ma Bob Marley. It did pretty successful. I didn't go see it, but kudos to those who did. But in Brazil, yes, we we're going back across the pond. You had a situation where there were people who went to go see the movie who a the demographic in Brazil, it does have people who would be con considered Afro-Brazilian that live there. But we all know the landscape of Brazil is very whitewashed, so to speak. And if you know your history about uh, slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, you know what stop they made first. It was over there. Well, what would become that in this later on? But you had this incident where somebody there asked, why are there so many blacks in the movie theater? Woman arrested for racism during showing a Bob Marley movie in Southern Brazil. And I believe this woman right here who had my cursor going over was the woman who said it. <clears throat> a woman identified as Bruna was arrested for racism during the screening of the film Bob Marley One Love at the Balneario, and I probably butchered that name, shopping cinema located in Santa Catarina. The complaint was made by a man named Jesus Clino, who was sitting in the next seat and heard the woman say, before there were no black people in the movie theater. Today, there are so many, he said on video. My friend and I went in and sat down and out of nowhere, the woman started looking at me differently. He says that when he asked her if she was saying that black people couldn't go to the movies, she replied, take it any way you want. This is a statement coming from Jesus Clayno. Yesterday, I went to the cinema. Me and my friend went to the cinema at the shopping center, at the shopping cinema. Then when we went in, we sat down and out of nowhere, a couple that was on our left side, the girl started looking at me differently and she looked at me differently. A little while later, she looked at me and said, wow, that's funny, isn't it? That before there weren't so many black people at the movies. Now there are a lot of black people at the movies. Then I said, is that what you're, sa is what you're saying serious? My friend next to me stood up and asked, is, what you're sa is that what you're saying? So in the old days, there were no black people in the movies. Today, there are. I said, so you're telling me that black people can't go to the movies. Is that what you're saying? And she said, no, nope, but take it any way you like. Bruna says she was misinterpreted. According to her, her statement about the cinema being full of black people was referring to the fact that this scenario is rare to see in the south of Brazil, where the public is usually white. If you don't get out of here with that BS, she going to sit up there and say, oh, it was misinterpreted. No, you said what you said and you meant it. I can almost imagine how she felt when Black Panther came out. So we see what she's on. And by the way, this is like I said, this is the woman right here that started it. This person right here. And this is the one that made the complaint. He said, I was there because this movie is also aimed at me because I am a non-dark skinned black woman, the daughter of a black man, the granddaughter of black grandparents. I was feeling represented when in a matter of seconds, everything went down the drain with the hearing of a decontextualized phrase. She said in an interview with the with the post. Similarly, Bruna reports that she was taken out of the movie theater by the security guards. They were very helpful. The security guard thought they would go in there to remove a white albino couple. But when he saw me, he didn't believe me. They told me to show a photo of my black family because the police would understand that it had nothing to do with it, she said. And that's the entire article right there. Let me just say this. Exactly, Tawana. She didn't expect to get arrested for it. Let me just say this. If this is how they would treat 
the more darker skin people over there, the ones who look like, you know, they couldn't, they didn't, they don't blend in well with probably the mass population over there. If they will say stuff about them like that over there, what do you think they, they are going, the, those dirty footed back hooved individuals, anti-black asses are going to do when they slither their way through the border and get over here when it comes to us? If they are anti-black to the people that are native to that land over there, what makes you think that if they got the chance to get over here illegally, by the way, because I mean, the border is wide open. What makes you think they're not going to be anti-black to us? Now, if you notice in the response that the man gave, it came off as a shocking one. Like they were shocked that this actually happened because he constantly questioned Oh, did you just say that? Oh, did this just happen? Yes, she said that. And yes, it did happen. See, with us, we know how this works. That's why, like Wallow J said in the chat, we bite back. Our response would have been a whole lot different. Because we know we have been so accustomed to dealing with Dub S for so long. Them, on the other hand, I don't know what or how their system is ran over there. So I'm not even going to try to guess. But when I tell you that Dub S is a global entity, it is. And the thing about it is the woman, this woman right here is not or would not by the standards of this establishment be considered white. Because, but because she's lighter in skin tone and I guess she feels that, oh, like I can blend in very well. You know, they're not going to check me. She fits right in. And like someone else said in the chat, she was shocked that she actually got checked on it, which tells me she's been holding on to these anti-black sentiments for quite some time. This did not just happen with this incident right here. I'm willing to bet she has said some slick stuff in the past. It's just that in this time, in this moment, she got caught and dealt with. So I'm not surprised by this in the least bit, but I bet I'll tell you this much. If people around the globe on a more collective scale, watch the new, the new black media and, and what we're pointing out to people here, if they watched it overseas, then they could be easily able to point it out to wherever it is that they're from. But then again, maybe they do know that dub is, is going on wherever they live, but many of them, unfortunately turn a blind eye. They pretend like it doesn't exist. They just move through life and just like say, oh, it, it just is what it is. But yeah, like I said, keep that in mind. If they would do that to their own over there, imagine what they'll say about us if they ever got the chance to get over here. You already know. And I'm willing to bet a lot of the people that's coming over here right now probably have the same sentiments as this woman. But with that being said, y'all, that's going to bring this weekly live stream to a close. Like I said, I was able to handle this within an hour. Shout out to everybody that came through. Shout out to AB Promotions for commit, contributing to the stream this evening. I greatly appreciate it. Shout out to all of the members, people on Patreon, Discord, Twitter, Instagram, all of that good stuff. Tomorrow, you will get the 11 a.m. Eastern Time premiere video. It's going to be about the south of the Bordarian crisis that's going on and affecting people out there in Denver. And also, you will be getting a, lot, a midday live stream, and it's going to be a collab with Kid Gravity and myself. And we're going to be going over this video from <sighs> Candace Owens. And this recent video that she just did, and when y'all read the title of it, it's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. When I saw it, I said, K I said KG, we definitely got to collab on this one. And he said, can we do it as a live? I said, you know what? Let's do it. So that'll be coming tomorrow. But y'all enjoy the rest of your evening. And we will be back on here tomorrow at 11 and 12. 
be safe and be one.